campaigns for sustainable de development. Um, this program has been called a name Challenger 150 um, and Kerry will present you all the details in the next half an hour or so and uh, after that we'll have some time for answer any questions that that you may have. Kerry? Um, Okay, uh, thanks, Anna. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to give you a, a, a half hour overview. I will try not to waffle. I'm prone to waffling, so I'll try not to. Um, of the programme as it stands. Um, and then, yeah, we'll have some time for questions. Um, just to let you know, we are recording this session. So if for any reason you don't want your face on a recording, um, feel free to switch your camera off. Um, we are recording now. I can always wipe the beginning if there's a problem. Um, and then um, if you if you have questions, perhaps if you type them in the chat, um, Anna's going to keep an eye on the questions as we go through the talk and then we'll come to them all at the end, um, perhaps rather than stopping in the middle in case people ask similar questions. Um, I think it's probably easier to put them in the chat than do the raise your hand, given there are so many people on the call. Um, yeah. yeah, is that okay? We'll do that. Um, okay, so without further ado, I'm going to attempt technology. Okay, hopefully everyone can see my screen. I failed at the first hurdle. Yeah, there you go. Okay, um, so before we tell you about the, the the Challenger program, I, I, I kind of want to go back and start with a, a bit of history. Um, many of you will remember the Census of Marine Life. Uh, this was a 10 year program, an international effort that took place between 2001 and 2010. And its purpose was to uh, assess the diversity, distribution and abundance of marine life. Um, many people were engaged in this program. It was a truly global uh, effort. And the achievements of that program can't really be understated. Um, I, I don't do them justice here really um, because it's one slide, but just to try to briefly summarize the Census of Marine Life achievements. It established a baseline for marine life and aggregated more than 30 million species level records and added millions more as well as describing over a thousand new species. It created the Ocean Biogeographic Information System, OVIS. It, it's hard to imagine that that didn't exist now, um, but it didn't, um, and it came from this program. It maps migration routes and breeding areas, and this helped uh, in conservation efforts and, and um, environmental management. It identified gaps in sampling and tried to fill them, some of which unfortunately still remain, and we'll come on to that. It revealed the history and future of human impacts on the marine environment in, in a really, you know, truly global way. We had a, a, a good picture of what was happening uh, in the marine environment. Um, it collaborated with the Encyclopedia of Life to complete more than 90,000 marine species pages, supported the World Register of Marine Species. But I think perhaps most importantly, um, and I think what may resonate with many people in the audience today is that it built individual, institutional, national and regional level capacity. Um, many of us, I think, academically grew up um, under the census of marine life um, and, and owe parts of our careers to that programme. Um, and so I wanted to kind of come on to this then. Of the, of the 17 recognised census of marine life projects, Five of them were deep sea. Um, so we had the, the Comarge project, which uh, dealt with continental margin ecosystems, the Mar Eco project, which dealt with uh, mid ocean ridges, the Cedar project, which dealt with abyssal marine life, Sensine, which dealt with seamount ecosystems, and then Chess, which uh, dealt with chemosynthetic ecosystems. Um, and many of us were involved in some way small or large, with one of these programs. Um, and I think the deep sea community, more than, more than most, uh, really identify with, understand and appreciate the need and value of these global level cooperative endeavors 
um, and really understand the sorts of gains there are to be had by trying to work together collaboratively uh, towards similar goals. Um, and coming out of the census of marine life, particularly uh, as part of the deep sea legacy, was the in-deep network, um, which was, again, really a, a, a network for uh, coordinating and collaborating uh, and communicating deep sea science globally ac across the deep sea science network. Um, and from in-deep, um, the, uh, the Deep Ocean Stewardship Initiative arose as well. Um, and some of the work of in-deep is continued today as part of the Deep Ocean Stewardship Initiative, and, and many people are, are involved in those things as well. Um, and so I think, it, I, I don't think it's too much to say that, that these deep sea programs were really moved deep sea science on, uh, really achieved a huge amount um, during that 10 year period. And since then, many different people in many different fora have talked about a new 10 year program. Um, and trying to do something like this again. Um, and some have even drawn up quite detailed plans for these things, but for whatever reason, it hasn't got off the ground. Um, and I think as, as, as someone put it, maybe it's because there wasn't the glue to kind of hold it together or hold the ideas together. Um, and I think really that is until now. Um, and here we enter the, the decade of ocean science for sustainable development. So for those of you who aren't aware, uh, the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development um, spans the period from 2021. So it's, it's really just beginning now. Um, it hasn't officially launched yet, but it's just getting going now um, until 2030. So a decade long period. Um, and I think it presents a real opportunity for our community, for the deep sea science community to try to once again come together to work on, on issues of deep sea science at a global scale. Um, so um, just to give you a bit of background to the decade of ocean science then, the, the roadmap for the decade was published in 2018. And I know there, there are people in the audience who, who've been heavily involved in that and worked on it. Um, but the actual roadmap already recognized the deep sea science as a frontier of science and discovery. It, it, it specifically has lines in there about the deep sea and calls for research to advance understanding of this, of this huge part of our planet. Um, and so there was always um, the opportunity, I suppose, it, it, it's written in there for, for the deep sea community to, to try and do something. Um, and then in the, in the decade implementation plan, which led on from the roadmap, um, and it was published last year by the UN. You can, you can go on the, the, the decade website to look at these things. Um, the the um, architects of that plan laid out um, the objectives uh, of, of what the decade hopes to achieve. Um, and it's been evolving as it goes along. And I think this is actually an older diagram. Now it's moved on again. Um, but essentially the purpose of the decade is to move us from, from the ocean we have to the ocean we want. Um, and the way in which we will move from one to the other is via the science we need. Um, and, and that science will be carried out um, and will try to achieve uh, four objectives. I think it's, it's now gone down to three, one has been incorporated in, but essentially there's these three to four objectives that, that the decade hopes to achieve um, in order to move us then from, from where we are to the ocean we want and to achieve um, so a, a series of societal outcomes which are laid out in the decade documents and so this are uh, they're over here on on this side of the screen so we have a clean ocean a healthy and resilient ocean a predicted ocean a safe ocean a sustainably harvested and productive ocean a transparent and accessible ocean and these are summarized there's a lot more detail in the actual document on these but but it gives you the idea of where we're trying to get to to where the decade's trying to get to Again, the means by which we'll move from one to the other are via, uh, via this pathway of science, which is built around four objectives. The first one deals with um, capacity for ocean science and also ocean literacy. Um, objectives two and three deal with the generation um, of knowledge through um, science um, and that science being relevant to society. And then we take that science and we apply it 
using tools and different services. We apply it to the challenges humans are facing um, in, in management of the ocean. And then um, having made, uh, having looked at what that science means in terms of decision making, we can then take that into the policy and decision making fora and use that best available science uh, to make those decisions for how we manage the ocean. Um, and so having read the roadmap and how deep sea features in it and um, discussions that had already, already been going on in various fora, um, many different groups, three different groups mainly, got together to discuss what uh, a decade program could look like. So as, as Anna already mentioned, the, the DOSI uh, Deep Ocean Stewardship Initiative formed a working group, um, the Decade of Ocean Science Working Group. Um, we also formed a, a SCORE working group, so Scientific Committee on Oceanic Research. Um, and actually prior to that, there'd been some discussions in the um, a, a group called the Challenger Deep Sea uh, Special Interest Group, which is part of the Challenger Society for Marine Science uh, in the UK. Um, and so this sort of group of people collectively um, looked at uh, one of the key questions in deep sea science that had been identified through various fora, including a, a European Marine Board report, um, but also a number of different publications that had um, that had summarised, you know, what are the still the questions we have in deep sea science that, that we've yet to crack. Um, and then also meetings as well. We had a meeting um, in, in London in 2018 to talk about the role of new technology potentially in, in helping unlock some of the questions we still have in deep sea science. But we took those published, uh, those uh, various publications and meeting reports, um, looked at the objectives of the ocean decade and, um, and the societal objectives and looked at them with a deep sea lens and, and mapped um, the deep sea science uh, gaps and knowledge and requirements onto those um, decade objectives and societal outcomes to produce, I guess, a deep sea version of, of, of the decade objectives and societal outcomes. Um, so you'll see this, this diagram very much mirrors the one I just showed you that came from the, the implementation plan of the decade. But that group of people basically drew up um, a blueprint, I suppose, for uh, an ocean decade program to study deep sea life. What, what might it look like um, given that it's matched to those decade objectives um, and societal outcomes? And so you see here, we move from the deep ocean we have and the various challenges that are, are faced by the deep ocean ecosystems and, and particularly human use of those deep ocean ecosystems um, to the deep ocean we want. Uh, which aligns with the, the overall decade outcomes. And that's why these objectives, so objective one is the capacity building and knowledge sharing objective. Objective two is about generating new ocean data. Objective three is about building ocean understanding. So bringing uh, data into modeling and um, looking at ecosystem functioning and, and these sorts of questions, and then moving then into um, Objective four, which is about increasing the use of ocean knowledge, so taking that new knowledge into the policy arena um, and, and helping to inform sustainable use and sustainable management. Um, and so this is really that, as I've said, that, uh, that decade uh, idea, but with a deep sea lens on it and, and, looking at, and looking at what it might mean to a deep sea program. Um, and this blueprint idea was, was published just at the end of last year. Um, so you can go and look at that paper if you if you want or ask me for a copy. Um, oh, I'll just go backwards a sec. So, so one, this is an overall program, but a big part of the program is, is the collection of, of new data. It's that generation of ocean data. Um, and so as, as, part of, um, as part of the development of this, uh, we also considered what a global scale field program might look like. How might we go about filling those gaps? Where are the gaps? Um, what would we, how would we want to design such a, a global program? What would it look like? And what advice can we provide to people who might want to contribute to that design and contribute to that overall um, um, field effort? So there was a second uh, paper that dealt very specifically with a field program. Um, and again, it, it's really a, a an outline, a, a blueprint, if you like, for 
what a global field program might look like, how it might work, and what might be the rules um, or the or the standards that we could provide that that might help uh, people to contribute. Um, and we named that program Challenger 150, uh, a decade to study deep sea life. So, I mean, what is it? I guess that's the main question. Um, in short, it's, it's easiest to think of it as, as rather like the census of marine life. It's, it's a global cooperative, which is devoted to delivering the science we need to sustainably manage the deep ocean. Um, fundamentally, it's a bit like the INDEEP network. It's a vehicle for coordination of deep sea research globally towards a set of common objectives. And those objectives are set out by the UN decade, but adapted for the deep sea uh, research and community and needs. So the idea is that the program will be realized through individual research projects committing to align with the program and in so doing become a piece in a larger global jigsaw puzzle. So it, it would be wonderful to have a, uh, a well-designed, truly global scale field program um, where uh, everybody already knows what needs to be done, what needs to be measured, in what way, we're all doing it in exactly the same way and different projects can pick off bits of that overall global program and at the end of it all, we have a full picture of what's happening uh, in the marine environment. But it, it's actually impossible and arguably um, not necessary to, uh, to fund a program, a single program on that scale. And the only way these global scale initiatives can work is by individual programs um, seeking their own funding, addressing their own questions, but where possible, aligning with an overall uh, set of objectives globally and for um, and for each program or sorry each project to know how it fits into that overall program and and what pieces of the jigsaw puzzle it's covering um, uh, such that we can try to achieve that that full picture but it'll just be done in in pieces so to give you an idea then of how the program, will operate um, and how we think uh, we can try as a community to to achieve these objectives. I'm going to give you a couple of examples of uh, places where we already have uh, things in place um, or where we've already given some thought to how how these things might work um, through the course of the program. So under objective one, then um, looking at capacity development and knowledge sharing, um, one of the things I think we all recognize was that we really need to broaden the, the knowledge base uh, and the research base for, for deep sea research. It, it is very focused in certain nations and certain parts of the world, um, and that leads to biased data collection. Um, so we need to broaden that, that knowledge base. Um, and one of the ways we can do that uh, is by um, offering opportunity uh, and coordinating what opportunities are out there to uh, ensure that um, that we're doing what we can to help broaden that base uh, collectively. Um, and so one of the things we, we uh, will be doing under this aspect is uh, working in partnership with Revation, who are a philanthropic organization, uh, you may have heard of them. They're also a partner in the Ocean Decade, um, the Standard MOU with uh, the UN IOC, um, but working with them on what we call the Deep Ocean Training Expeditions, the DOT Expeditions. And these are really aimed at building uh, long-term capacity for developing nation scientists and also early career scientists. So Revolution have committed to funding 18-day um, ship time a year uh, for this purpose. And the aim here then is to empower scientists from developing nations to engage in deep sea research. Um, it'll follow the concept of the UNESCO IOC's training through research program, the TTR program, which um, many of you may have participated in um, and we know was a, a, a very successful model. Um, and in doing so, then this will provide training in deep sea science for a range of people. Um, but what it will also do then is because during the training, of course, we will be doing research and that will enable us to expand our knowledge of deep sea ecosystems in poorly known regions and particularly focusing on the EEZs of developing nations 
um, and also in the high seas where we know there are huge data gaps uh, in deep sea science. So moving on then, um, an important aspect of, of the ocean decade is that the, the science uh, and the work delivered is, is co-designed and co-delivered. And that's really to ensure that, that the science is really meeting the end user need. Um, and so one of the things we uh, will do under the program then is form these regional committees. So these are um, groupings of, of regional, of scientists working in the region, deep sea scientists working in the region together with uh, relevant regional stakeholders, and those may be national, they may be regional, like for example, in the South Atlantic, the Benguela Current Commission uh, deals with a sort of large marine ecosystem scale, or they may be international like the UN. Um, and uh, these, these groups will ensure that there is good communication uh, locally of what research is being carried out, um, and also um, that that research can meet the uh, regional science need. Um, and so those uh, committees should consist ideally of, of, um, of local, local to that region, deep sea researchers. Um, and this will enable a, a flexible approach and, and adaptation of the science being carried out to local policy needs as much as possible. Okay, so moving on to, to objective two, which is to generate ocean data. It's a, it's a huge part of, of what we do uh, as deep sea scientists um, and, um, and is a big part of any 10 year program. So we, I've already mentioned that we've kind of put a blueprint together for a global scale field program um, and that that will operate in all ocean basins. And, and really it's designed to fill the data gaps. So um, at the end of the census of marine life, um, each of the different projects identified where there were still data gaps. Um, and there have been numerous papers, and I've, I've picked on one by Tom Webb, but there are, there are others as well, that just show the distribution of, of data that we have in, in OVIS. And you can see that as you go deeper, there is much less data. Um, and also in some parts of the world, particularly the Southern Hemisphere, uh, we have huge data gaps. And, and what that means is that our understanding of the deep sea ecosystem is currently very biased, uh, which is not helpful when you're trying to understand systems and develop models uh, in order to make predictions. Biased data sets aren't helpful. So we need to fill those data gaps. Um, and on this particular topic, um, the Schmidt Ocean Institute have also um, um, agreed to uh, come into collaboration with the program and have committed um, their nine research cruises over the next couple of years uh, to contribute data and knowledge to this uh, effort. So that's really, really fantastic. And that's in addition to uh, Rev Ocean, which I already mentioned. Um, so a big part of this then is um, the need to start to standardize uh, methods. Um, and again, this, this was really recognized under the census and a huge amount of work was done under those different uh, projects that I mentioned to think about standardization and how we can make our data more comparable um, between individual projects such that we can put data sets together and it will tell us much more uh, about the global ocean. And there's been work going on um, in this arena by the Global Ocean Observing System. So many of you will have heard of Goose. Um, who have been working on the development of what they call essential ocean variables. Um, and these are things that everyone can measure and, and perhaps uh, things that ideally should be measured because there may be an indicator of, of, of ocean health or um, something along those lines. I think it's fair to say though that the Goose um, initiative is really very much an oceanographic one. Um, it does have a bioeco panel and there have been essential ocean variables developed under that, but they're less well developed than the oceanographic ones. And I think it's fair to say they've been largely shallow water focused. So the deep ocean observing strategy, which um, Lisa Levin and a number of others have been engaged with, um, has been looking at uh, these essential ocean variables again through a deep sea lens and looking at what those might be for deep sea. And also thinking about further development of the biological and ecological essential ocean variables. And so on top of this as well, there have been a number of publications uh, by folks in our community 
who have dealt with this issue of needing to generate more consistent data sets um, and what it is we should be measuring, could be measuring, and how we could be measuring it. Uh, so a paper by uh, Lucy Woodall and, and colleagues, and um, there's a couple of us here. I'm, I'm sure there are more, and my apologies if I've missed uh, one of your publications. Um, but I mean, it's, it's not a new problem. We're, we're well aware of this. Um, and so the programme will spend a, a lot of effort in trying to standardise methods um, and what we should be measuring and to build on what's already there. We're right? not trying to reinvent anything. There's a huge amount of work gone on already here, um, but there are we can take more steps forward in this in this area. OK, so under objective three, then building ocean understanding. Um, Again, there's a huge amount of value to be had from coordination, um, collaboration and, and strategic targeting of things like samples and also experimentation. So, um, for example, it may be that um, through the Challenger programme, we can coordinate to ensure that we replicate experimental setups in multiple ocean basins. Uh, in order to generate a more holistic picture of how the deep sea ecosystem works and responds to things like uh, climate related uh, changes. Similarly, um, if, I mean, many people do this already, but it can take quite a while. If we're targeting, if we collectively agree to target particular taxa for sampling, we can produce much more extensive data sets of species for things like population genetics, phylogenetics, so we can better develop our understanding of connectivity across the deep sea, uh, which is really quite important to sustainable management um, and um, conservation of, of uh, deep sea ecosystems. So there's a, an important coordinating role there and strategic targeting of um, efforts in order to achieve more between multiple projects. And then with these standardized methodologies and coordination of, of data collection, this is the type of activity that starts to provide global data sets that are suitable for modeling and prediction. Um, and I mean, so with that, this is, um, modeling and prediction is, is really very important to decision-making. Um, if you're trying to manage uh, any area of ocean um, as a, as a <laughs> as an environmental manager, you need to be able to understand the potential implications of your decisions. So what happens if I pursue this course of action as opposed to this course of action? And understanding what that means in ecological terms requires that you're able to forecast. You have to be able to predict what might happen if you do this versus this. Um, and so we can take these um, standardized, uh, more extensive data sets and apply them into modeling and prediction to inform spatial management. So we can develop um, more robust models between uh, over the, over the, uh, over all the project's outputs. Okay, and then moving on to objective four then, increasing use of ocean knowledge. So, so the whole point of the decade is to inform sustainable management and, and we cannot forget that. This is the decade of ocean science for sustainable development. So that knowledge needs to go to end users and we need good pathways to take that scientific knowledge to end users and bring it into the policy and decision-making fora. Um, and the DOCI network have been really, really very successful in doing this through the different working groups. So the minerals working group, the fisheries working group, and I know many people are engaged in those working groups. But it's not the only way um, there are also individuals have uh, engaged with other processes by the UN, for example, the EBSA process. Many people will have been involved in those EBSA workshops, um, taking deep sea knowledge into, into these um, fora uh, and ensuring that they are helping inform how we use the environment. Um, and also then there's national fora as well, and, and individual scientists from different nations have taken deep sea science into their national fora. Um, and so the programme will try again to coordinate that sort of activity and establish uh, good pathways between science and, and end users of science um, to ensure that we're collectively informing uh, the way the deep sea is uh, used um, and how that policy evolves. 
So what's the current state of play with the programme? Well, um, I want to be really clear about this. The, the Challenger 150 programme is not a formal Ocean Decade programme. There are no formal programmes at the moment. Um, the IOC put out a call for, um, for recognition, for um, application to be recognised as a formal decade programme. That call went out at the end of last year. The closing date was uh, in January this year. And so uh, we made an application to the IOC for recognition of Challenger 150 as an official Asian Decade program, and we await the outcome of that decision, along with others who, who have applied for that. Um, we have a commitment from Schmidt Ocean Institute and Rev Ocean um, for cruises to support the program, including the training cruises for capacity building, which is absolutely excellent. There are currently 24 funded research cruises. Some of those are SOI cruises. The others are from members of the community who have just um, you know, heard about the program, recognized the value of it, and put their hand up and said, yeah, I reckon I can align my, I can reckon I can align my cruise with this program and I want to try to do what I can to, to try to help contribute. Um, so 24 funded research cruises all taking place over the next three years, basically 14 in the Pacific, nine in the Atlantic, one in the Southern Ocean. Um, and so that's a really great start to the programme. Um, and we hope then to build on that. So the next steps for the programme then are to fully operationalise it, um, which is, is quite a tall order. Um, but uh, hopefully you know, there'll be, there'll be those in the community who, who are willing to get involved and get their hands dirty. So we need to revisit the steering committee. At the moment, that is the school working group. Um, but the school working group concludes in 2022. Um, it was set up to help develop a programme and, and get it up and running. Um, and so when the programme is fully operational, we may need to revisit that, that steering committee to make sure it's still um, fit for purpose. Um, we need to start forming these uh, regional committees of both uh, scientists working in a particular region and also then thinking about the stakeholders for that region uh, to get that communication flowing uh, both between deep sea researchers in the region and also um, into those, those end user stakeholders. Um, and then we also need, and this is possibly the most urgent one, to start to develop and agree on standardization of, of methods and measurements. And this is very much working with uh, the DEUCE initiative. Um, and also, as I said, building on everything that's gone before. We, there is absolutely no need to reinvent the wheel. A lot of good people have spent a lot of time thinking about this so we can build uh, on what's there already. So how can you get involved? Well, before I kind of come on to that, um, I just want to really reiterate, you know, what, what Challenger 150 is. It's, it's a grassroots initiative. It, it belongs to our community. A huge number of people have been involved in getting us this far. And, and I'd really like to name and thank every one of them, but, um, but I'm worried I'd, we'd miss someone. So, so um, there are a lot of people who've helped us get to this point. And it's taken a lot of effort, so thank you. Um, the programme will be what, what we choose to make it. Um, and I hope that particularly people who are involved in the census can see and understand the value of this global cooperation and collaboration and what it can achieve. Um, so if you if you think you would like to get involved and, um, and if you're willing to kind of help make this happen, then what you can do is um, sign up to the DOSI Decade Working Group email list. So the web address is right there. You can go to that website and you can click on sign up to the working group and it'll, it'll email the, um, a lovely lady called Hannah who will uh, add you to the email list. That is the main channel of communication we're using at the moment to contact people who are willing to get involved uh, and, and want to contribute. So that's the best thing to do. In the next week, so we'll give people a chance to think about it, to maybe watch the recording of this. But then in the next week, uh, Anna and I will send out an email to organize a meeting of that working group. So come to that meeting and volunteer yourself for tasks that interest you. It's a huge undertaking to get the global program working. Um, and so we really need people who are, are willing to, to put their hand up and get involved. And, and help us 
shape this program into more than the sum of its contributing parts. And that is the whole point of coming together. We can achieve so much more together than we can as individual projects working on deep sea science. Sure, we could all carry on doing our individual projects, but I really think there's, there's something we can achieve by working together. And the census showed us that. Um, and, and I think leave, what we hope to all do, I hope, is, is leave a legacy uh, as great as, or maybe even greater than, uh, the Census of Marine Life uh, programme. So um, I'll finish there and we'll maybe take uh, questions. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> so there's quite a few questions on the chat right now. Um, the first one, can go by order was Tina asking how we can how we can add additional cruises to the to the program. Yeah, so I, do you want to? I can answer that if you really want to. Anna, <laughs> any questions? Um, so yeah, the the idea is then that um, if you have a cruise that you you already have funded and you know it's happening and it's already planned. Um, and, but you think that where possible, you're happy to make some tweaks or to, to help get involved in this program, um, then, then you, you, you simply just need to let us know basically, and we can add it to the list we have of those cruises that people have already sort of said, yeah, I'll, I'll put mine in. Um, what we'll be doing really soon is gathering together the, the PIs of those cruises who have uh, already put their hands up to start to think about how we can coordinate what's, what's already going ahead. The next step then is for cruises that aren't necessarily planned yet or funded yet, but 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 we'd be looking to do. Um, and I think there there's more room for for as more flexibility there, hopefully for a, a tweaking programs to to cover some of the needs, uh, the science needs of the region or the stakeholders. Um, and so by participating in those uh, regional committees, um, that's where you'll be able to kind of, uh, I guess, coordinate with the other plans for that region and, and try to build something that, that works as part of a coherent regional study. Um, and then moving beyond that then uh, uh, is, is the really strategic work that we would like to do that, that's a bit of the way down the line yet. But there will, even with this, be gaps. You know, there'll be areas that simply aren't getting covered by people's general interests and their uh, writing grants and normal initiatives and that's where we we hope to be able to go there's a gap here we need to help support someone to write a proposal to get some ship time in this region um, and to develop a really strong proposal and, and help support that in getting funded so there's that aspect of it as well which will come in time I think yeah in, in sequence to that there's the one million dollar question by Kristen sorry Kristen I can never pronounce your name which is if we already have the the glue to 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 fund all the workshop activities and working groups uh, and other mechanisms to to for the standardization of activities um we don't yet I think I can answer that <laughs> um we are still working on score funds and dozy funds so, so far we, we rely on this and um, we will obviously try to get funds for, for all these sorts of, of activities. Um, also on, on, on that end, Elisabetta, you, you ask if we will grant young researchers or researchers in, in general to make available by chance to foster collaboration and, and we do. Um, these dot expeditions that Kerry was talking about, they mainly aimed at uh, developing countries, but also young researchers from, from all over the, the world. So we, this is, these are training activities and they're aimed particularly at, 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 young, at young researchers. Um, I'd also add on the, on the um, funding side, you know, there's, there's, there is no m real money in the decade itself, um, but there are, uh, a lot of partnerships with philanthropic organizations who are <coughs> engaged with the decade um, and so there are there is opportunity through that and we've already seen that through our partnerships with SOI and REV who are both partners in the ocean decade itself um, but also um, folks in in some nations have, have already started uh, getting together groups of people 
to bid for funds from their own national institutes. So there's there's been what um, movements afoot in the states um, to look at what funding might be available for the ocean decade uh, and to um, and to try to put targeted actions together to contribute to the to Challenger 150 through that means. And and similarly in the UK and I think in Portugal as well, Anna, if, if I'm right. Um, we have a, a, a question from Otis, and uh, he asks how, how, how can early research uh, um, best contribute to this initiative, um, as we can necessarily initiate our own expeditions or research programs? Um, well, I mean, I think anyone can engage in the, in the program with an, their ideas, their thoughts, their opinions. Um, Obviously, early career researchers are not necessarily in a position to apply for, for funding or cruises, um, but the programme is more than just the field bits. Okay? We, we focus a little bit on the field and the new collection of data, but it is also about translation of science into policy and engaging with stakeholders and society. Um, and so participation in things like the DOSI working groups or national, uh, national groups um, where the focus is taking science and helping inform policy is really, really important. And so early career researchers have a huge role to play uh, in that arena, um, you know, where they perhaps can't as easily contribute in the pulling in funding arena. Uh, you know, I think it would probably be easier for people to raise hands at this stage. <laughs> what, what do you reckon? Um, there's a few questions still from before, um, especially Tina uh, is asking if we if we can if Challenger 150 can can support some kind of letter of support or, or the dozy working group for when we apply for for programs. And um, do you answer that, Kerry? Uh, um, yeah, I can. Yeah. Um, no, we, we, we certainly can. So at the moment, um, so these mechanisms need to be developed uh, and, and in, in agreement with, with all those who've been engaging with the programme so far. Um, but essentially, yes, that's the whole, I guess that's a massive benefit of this, having an umbrella programme like this, is that you can then have, uh, you know, letters of support saying this project is going to contribute to this massive global initiative, and that might help funders look on it more favourably. Um, what we have at the moment is a is a, a document which sort of lays out the um, principles, I suppose, the principles of being part of this program. And so, at the moment, I think we would ask people to look at those principles um, and agree to those principles, and then um, we can provide letters of support. But we're, but we're still developing, you know, how we're going to do that and how this whole program is going to run. Um, so, yeah, you have to bear with us on some of this. Uh, until we get the whole thing fully operational um, and as well if anybody would like to help us <laughs> do that please do uh, as I say there's lots of work to do just little things like that but they're so important to get right uh, so Ben Ben is asking how, how do we effectively lobby slash coordinate to get this program higher up in the agenda of national funding bodies so that alignment of project is seen as positive. That's a great question, Ben. Um. <laughs> I think the, the, the first, I mean, the most, we've been doing this in sort of little steps, really. And I think that's the only way you can move something of this size. And it, and it feels a bit glacial sometimes, but I think that's the only way it can go is, um, so the first and most important step is, is recognition by the IOC. I think the, I hope at the point at which we are officially recognized as a, as a decade program will be really significant because, um, you know, suddenly that, that gives that sort of UN stamp, if you like, on it. Um, and then, I mean, I can tell you from the UK side, Ben, that, that um, the, there is a committee, there's a national committee that's dealing with the decade um, I think they're still figuring out how they're going to deal with the decade, but the suggestion so far is that um, people submit um, 
uh, what are they called, hot topics and um, strategic priority fund applications for um, decade related activity. And again, having, having that sort of official recognition by the UN will, will make all the difference, I think, in putting something into certainly the UK national um, uh, funding bodies. But in, I, I mean, I think globally, it, it, it's raising the profile of the whole programme. It's getting sufficient membership of the programme globally to really you know, stamp a mark down. So the more people who engage with this, the, the more high up the agenda it becomes and the, the easier it is to sell to national funding agencies. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that's basically we, we do what we can to raise the profile of this program and make it something like, you know, this, the Seabed 2030 program. I mean, we, I think most people have now heard of Seabed 2030 uh, and all these things start in this way. We just have to build it up and up um, until it's, you know, recognized everywhere. Um, yes. Um... Regarding with the connected with these national committees, Elva is saying that not all um, nations have a national committee as for yet for the decade. And Tina earlier asked, and uh, I can reproduce her words, if Elva can give us an update of what is going on regarding the endorsement of the different programs. Um, Elva, can you can you answer that? Do you know? Um, sure. <laughs> sure. Um, um, we will actually meet until Thursday. I am in, at the evaluation committee, and then we will learn how many programs there are, and which the, which programs are, and which overlap. So, I, at this moment, I don't know. I don't have any clue. We haven't met yet. Uh, there was a, a startup meeting with the committee, but unfortunately, I couldn't make it at the same time. Um, so I missed that and I will just get the minutes. That was uh, a week ago, but it was just to the startup to inform that there were going to be all these seminars and, and so on. So I, it, I didn't really miss very much, but I know that uh, we will get to know this Thursday a little bit more about the programs. And I can certainly try to inform you immediately. Uh, on, the, on the comment I wrote about the national com com committees, I think it's very important that we have national committees because that is a point that will keep us talking as nations from in, the, in a very broad scale, in a very more political scale. But um, we can anyway work without those com committees. We can work through the science by doing great science, cruises and engaging people, especially the younger ones. I'm very interested that uh, early career professionals engage in the programs, that they participate, that they are part of the mentorship programs, that they are part of the capacity building programs. Um, capacity building is probably one of the most important ones and many of you have cited it, uh, for instance, for taxonomy and, and, and so on. And I am and aware that um, funding agencies and uh, in particular, the philanthropic organizations are very interested that those exercises take place so that we unify the knowledge, that we unify many of the activities in good practices or in best practices. Um, that's what I can say, I don't know. Am I missing something of your question, Anna? No, I think, I think you answered, Tina, is that there's yeah. no, and, no and the reason that, on <laughs> yeah, regarding the reason many programs when we will know more. Um, but I guess, as predicted, will be around April, May. Yeah, and the reason I included IPVS as a comment is I have been in contact with Patricia Valvanera, who is in charge of the ecological evaluation. And, um, and I noticed in the last report that there is nothing about oceans. And I mentioned her the importance of having oceans included. And she said, well, you were included. And I said, yeah, but the format didn't include a way to include oceans. So we are always being left out and she's going to look for that. And she insisted, well, I insisted to her that deep ocean is probably the most important challenge that they will have. And she wondered whether she should talk, for instance, to DOSI or to one of these programs to engage the deep ocean as well 
in their assessment. Thanks, Alva. You're welcome. Um, I've just seen this. So in the in the chat, there are just a load of really great suggestions. I just want to point that out. So Saskia uh, is talking about um, taxonomic training workshops for dealing with the taxonomic impediments, which you know we all are aware there's a serious problem with loss of taxonomic expertise. Um, Rui is uh, mentioning. Um, Darwin Initiative as a, as a UK funding uh, initiative uh, as, a, as a way to help generate funding for, for program for projects under this program and um, Chris McGonagall's talking about reciprocal exchanges on research cruises to increase cohesion a bit like in Europe we have this Erasmus uh, uh, Erasmus uh, exchange program well we don't anymore in the UK because my government's an idiot but um, but yeah, I mean, so these are all absolutely brilliant ideas. And so, yes, please, you know, br please bring them to the working group. This is what we need. People with ideas who say, you know, this is this could work. And also I'm willing to I'm willing to take a lead in getting it off the ground because, you know, it, it, it really does rely entirely on on people yeah. giving their time. There, there is no money to pay for this. Everyone has been doing it off their own backs because they think it's a worthwhile thing. Um, and so if, if you think there's something you're passionate about and you're willing to, to take it on, then, then please come to the meetings and, and say, oh, I'll take responsibility for that um, because that's how these things happen. So, so great ideas. Um, I think some, ooh, where are we? There was another one about, just me say about, about the use of math mathematical modeling scientists and I already replied yes and Ben and Ben agreed <laughs> we definitely need them on board um yeah most certainly um so I think um yeah I'm just conscious of the time it's two minutes to three yeah. uh okay. I, Hannah, I don't know Hannah if you... just, oh, sorry Hannah just posted the the website so if everyone wants to take note of that and there you can subscribe to the working group. Yeah, was there any last burning questions that we failed to answer and missed up the chat? If you either raise your hand or unmute yourself and just shout it out. <laughs> no, I think we're good. <laughs> okay. Um, Okay, so, uh, well, just, I mean, on behalf of Anna and I, thank you very much for coming along today to hear, to hear what we have to say and, and where we're at with this, with this program and its development. Um, really thank you all for your time um, and for your great ideas and questions and suggestions. And um, yeah, just to reiterate, you know, this, this, is, this is ours um, and we can make it what we, we want it to be. Um, and hopefully it will be something that, that does some good and, and leaves a legacy for those who come after in the way that 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 the census did for for many of us so um thank you very much i will we'll, we'll make the recording available uh via the dosi challenger web page i think yeah. best place for it yeah um and hope to see some of you at the next dosi decade working group um which we will be emailing about in the next week and just be careful that dosi emails don't go in your clutter for mine, some of them just go straight into the clutter box. So do check your clutter email address uh, over the next week, just in case. Mine, mine go directly to Chunk as well. So. Very <laughs> look, look in the Chunk for those emails. <laughs> okay, thank you everyone. Um, hopefully see you again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, Anna. I'm going to stop it. Oops.